Hello, guys, and welcome again to Five Sono Minutes. Welcome from Austria. Today, I would like to present you Mishka, which was an unusual case of dyspnea in a cat. So, Mishka is a domestic long hair cat, one year year of age, male and neutered. One week ago, uh, the owner went to see the local vet because Mishka was suffering from diarrhea and was not eating anymore. He got some injections. The owner didn't, didn't know what injections they actually were. And now he's eating normally and doesn't have any diarrhea anymore. But since yesterday, he shows some labored breathing and was presented as an emergency case. If you look at Mishka, you will easily see that Mishka has a very frequent and shallow breathing pattern, which is called restrictive breathing pattern. Restrictive breathing pattern can occur with any pathology in the lungs or the pleural space. So basically, congestive heart failure is one differential diagnosis. Of course, uh, we did a quick clinical exam. Interestingly, Mishko was quite calm. His heart rate was about 160. He had a soft heart murmur and the gallop sound. As you know, gallop sounds are very specific for cardiac disease, for advanced cardiac disease. A heart murmur is unspecific. He had a respiratory rate of 50 to 60 per minute. It didn't show any open mouth breathing. Interestingly, his blood pressure was not very high. I mean, he wasn't very excited, but still blood pressure was something between 100 and 110 millimeters of mercury in systole measured by, by Doppler. Of course, this, the first thing I did was um, a chest or lung ultrasound, a fluid ultrasound focused uh, lung ultrasound in dyspnea. What I found was some free fluid inside the pearl uh, space and some wet lung signs. So you can see the comet tail artifacts here, the so-called B lines tell you there's something going on within the interstitial spaces of the lung. Yeah, there are some A lines as well. So lung is not so bad here. Yeah. This is the next video here. There's a little bit more B lines to, to be seen here, especially here on the right side. There's A lines again. And we looked at the heart as well. And what we found is some left atrial enlargement. This is the left atrium. This is the aorta. The heart is, the left atrium is not extremely large, but it is large. Right. So as you can see, this is the aorta. This is the left atrium. The diameter shouldn't be, shouldn't exceed 1.5 times the aortic root diameter, which it does in this case. So left atrium is, of course, too large. So. This is a long axis view. It's not very good of quality because it was a quick cardiac ultrasound. Yeah, but you can see there's a lot of left ventricular concentric hypertrophy here. The left atrium is large. Yeah, there is some pericardial fluid as well. And there's B lights here in this lung field. Yeah, on the right side, there is a normal heart just to compare. Yeah. So the diameter of the left atrium in systole was nine, nine point and, and was almost 19 millimeters. It should usually it should not exceed 16 millimeters in a normal sized cat. If it's a main cone, it can be up to 20, maybe 21, but in a normal sized cat it shouldn't be larger than 60 millimeters. So it was too large and is and you can also see here there is some uh, pericardial fluid and there is free, free fluid in the pore space. So then we did an ultrasound with the echo probe. Again, you can see some pericardial fluid, some pleural fluid here. The left atrium is too large. The intraatrial septum is bulging towards the transducer, and there's a lot of left ventricular concentric hypertrophy to be seen. Short axis U shows as well uh, significant left ventricular concentric hypertrophy. This was the lateral X-ray. What you can see is there is some flu free fluid visible here close to the sternum and also here uh, called dorsally. And of course, there is pulmonary edema, at least interstitial edema seen uh, in the lung field, mainly in the ventral aspects here. Uh, and this is congested pulmonary veins. Uh, what we did, of course, we did the thoracocentesis. We took some of the fluid out. We gave 
Mishka diuretics, starting with a bolus or sforzamide continued uh, with a continuous rate infusion, and we gave him antitrombotics. I mean, it's debatable here, but uh, the general rule at our hospital is once a cat is in congestive heart failure, they have to re uh, re receive antitrombotics. And he got oxygen in an oxygen box. A couple of hours later, we did a, a detailed echo. So you can see the echo here on the left side. And if you look closely at the mitral valve, you can see that the mitral valve leaflets are pulled towards the interventricular septum in systole. This is called systolic anterior motion, or SAM, and causes dynamic obstruction of the outflow tract and turbulence here. Turbulence can also be seen here by the fluttering of the aortic valve. Yeah? So this is dynamic obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract due to SAM. This is the short axis view. And if we did an M mode, of course, of the left ventricle, and, this, and it, it revealed the thickness of the left ventricular walls in diastole of about seven millimeters. So it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't exceed six millimeters, of course. Yeah. So this was the exact LAO measurement here in Mishka, uh, something like, oh, it's cut off here. I think it was 1.9 or something or, or two. So it was not extremely large, as you can see. Yeah? Uh, this on the right side, there is an extremely large left atrium. You can also see it's not only the body of the left atrium, but also the uh, left auricular appendage is massively enlarged. And this is logical then that cats develop thrombi right here, yeah? because there's blood stasis then. Yeah? But the left atrial size always reflects um, the chronicity and severity of the disease. So if the disease is not that chronic, then the left atrium is not that large. Yeah? It doesn't mean that the cat is not in congestive heart failure. If you see an enlarged left atrium in a cat and pulmonary edema, it is likely that the pulmonary edema is a cardiogenic one. Yeah? It, um, the left atrium doesn't have always to doesn't always have to be very large, like in the right case. Yeah? This is a case of a very chronic disease. Yeah? The left atrial size in diameter, as I told you, was here 1.8. Uh, centimeters, so a little smaller than previously measured, maybe because of the diuretics. So on the next day, the cat was doing quite well, no dyspnea anymore, a um, little bit de dehydrated, systolic blood pressures were normal as well, and the lung looked much better now. So potassium was a little bit low, so we supplemented it. Um, we started or we exchanged or replaced the continuous rate infusion of rosamide by bolosis. We continued with heparin. Uh, we gave some uh, potassium and uh, no oxygen was needed anymore. Troponin, interestingly, was extremely high, so it was unmeasurable. It was more than 25 nanograms per milliliter, which is really, really high and usually not what you expect in a classical HCM. And the probe MP was also unmeasurably high, so more than 1,500. The next morning, CAT was doing well. X-rays were, were even better compared to the previous day. So we sent him home on frosamide, two mix per kick BID. We gave some potassium. We asked uh, the owner to monitor the sleeping respiratory rate appetite and come for a recheck in a month. After two weeks, we did a phone call and reduced frosamide to one mg per kg per idea and then further to 0.5 mg per kg per day. One month later, the owner came back, Cat was doing well, and he had already discontinued uh, continued, uh, frosamide to zero. On exam, the cat had a normal respiratory rate, no heart murmur anymore, no gallop sound, and a normal heart rate. This was the x-ray. So without forosomide, everything was well. So luckily, I didn't tell the owner your cat had HCM, because usually HCM is, um, is um, uh, thought to be genetic, right? So if you, if you call something HCM, then usually the owners, once they start Googling, uh, they think that their cat is going to die. Yeah? You, you should always say it's a phenotype, an echocardiographic phenotype of HGM. You shall never say it's, it is HGM. So this was the recheck echo. 
as you can see, there is no systolic anterior motion anymore and not much of a left ventricular wall thickening as well on short axis views, much better. Yeah. Left atrial size without frosamide was just 40 millimeter, which is within the reference range. Yeah. This is the LAO ratio in short axis views, also completely normal. And the left ventricular thickness, the wall thickness, was something around four to five millimeters, so actually normal. Two months later, if you look at this heart, looks quite normal now. So normal left atrial diameter, 1.38 uh, centimeters, which is completely normal, without any medication anymore. Also, the left LAO ratio was something like 1.3, left ventricular wall thickness, uh, 0 0.46 centimeters, 4.6 millimeters, which is normal. So HGM is not always a genetic HGM. There is an HGM phenotype. This is from, uh, from the consensus statement uh, published in the Journal of Veterinary Inter Internal Medicine a couple of years ago. Um, that shows clearly that there is a proportion of cats um, within the HM phenotype who actually have HM, but many others don't. They can have hypertension, re reduced preload, neoplastic inflammation, transient myocardial thickening, acromegaly, hypothyroidism, and so on. And there's a very interesting study that has been published in. 2004 is a long time ago, where they, descri they described um, 12 cats with corticosteroid associated congestive heart failure. So they described cats who developed heart failure after the in administration of corticosteroids. And what is really interesting is that um, the time from the corticosteroid administration to the diagnosis of congestive heart failure was as short as one day following an injection of methylprednisolone to as long as 19 days in a cat that received a course of oral prednisolone followed by an injection of triamcinolone. Yeah? So it can take some time. Um, and initially we always, always uh, thought, okay, it's just the injectable form. We don't know, maybe it's an oral form as well that can uh, trigger um, congestive heart failure. What is interesting is that these cats don't have so thick left ventricular walls. So it's something between 5.5 to 7.5 millimeters. Yeah. Also, if you look at the uh, left atrial diameter, they don't have these really giant left atrial uh, diameters because it's an acute onset of the disease. Uh, um, so it was in this study, the cats received different oral and parental formulations. Um, four of these cats had repeated corticoid administrations over the past years but at once developed congestive heart failure. Interestingly, all these cats had a quite low blood pressures, so 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Many of them had pleural effusion. Most of them had just moderate to severe interstitial infiltrates and not alveolar edema. A couple of years later, 2018, there was a nice study by Matos uh, describing transient myocardial thickness, th th thickening. This was the birthday of the new term TMT, uh, which means a transient thickening of the left ventricular myocardium that can end up in congestive heart failure. So cats can develop concentric hypertrophy and congestive heart failure and normalize again afterwards. This usually happens after certain antecedent events, and these antecedent events can be very different. It, they are usually uh, within the past 14 days before the onset of congestive heart failure. TMT cats are significantly younger than cats with HCM, and in HCM, usually you, you, you have um, significantly more male cats in congestive heart failure. In TMT, it's quite equal between males and females. 
The antecedent events in this study were general anesthesia, car accident, vaccination, bite wounds, fever, infection, or the administration of certain drugs. So not only corticosteroids, but many other drugs as well. The TMT cats showed a significantly thinner myocardium than the HGM cats and smaller left atrial dimensions, like in the previous study that I showed you about corticosteroids. And they usually normalized within about three months. The LAO ratio in TMT cats was about, and the median was about 1.8, and in HGM it was about 2.4, as you can see. Same systolic anterior movement happened in about the same uh, percentage of cats in both groups. Pericardial effusion was also seen in both groups, so it doesn't really tell you something about the origin. Yeah? But troponin was very high in TMT cats. In TMT, significantly, it was not significant, but it was there was a tendency towards much higher tro troponin values in the TMT cats, and it normalized again in these cats as opposed to HCM cats. So the take home message is never state the diagnosis of this is HCM. Always, if you do an echo, always say this is a phenotype of HCM, an echocardiographic phenotype of HCM, because you'll never know. There are differential diagnoses to HCM. TMT cats usually have significantly smaller left atria, lower blood pressures, and higher tro troponin levels. So in Mishka, I mean, I told you that Mishka received certain injections when he had diarrhea. My suspicion is that he received some injectable cortisone and then developed TMT, which resolved afterwards. So good news for cats. They don't always die in congestive heart failure. Some of them normalize again and have even a normal cardiac phenotype after a couple of months. So take care. Best regards from Austria and hope to see you again in the next session. Bye.